I was fortunate to meet with a number of successful property investors at a round table just recently. The forum was set up to get a group view on possible growth opportunities for the group and for its individual members. Hello, I'm Kevin Turner and welcome to this week's Realty Talk Show. One of the big learnings for me from that forum was the challenge of ensuring continued equity growth in a portfolio after the events of the past couple of years. The market has expanded so rapidly over the past 24 months where people just think, well, I'll just buy any house and it'll be worth you know, 500,000, it's now worth 600,000. That last 24 months is not what the next 24 months is going to look like. We address those challenges today as Bushy talks to Joe Tucker about manufacturing equity in your portfolio. Also today, we look past your existing property portfolio and uncover different ownership options if you're considering adding more property. At the time of your purchase, you go off to your accountant and create a bear trust. Yeah. And the bear trust, because of legislation, can hold the property until such time that the self-managed super fund does not have any more debt. Mancia Melli joins Bushy in the second part of today's show. If this is your first time with us, well, welcome. And you're going to find us on all podcast players and through the Southern Cross Oz Stereo Network. If you like the show, and I hope you do, hit the subscribe button and help us continue to bring you the best guests. We'll be back in just a moment as Bushy kicks off this week's show. Property deductions can save you thousands of dollars each year. To make sure you maximise deductions, you need to work with the most experienced quantity surveyor in the country. BMT Tax Depreciation is the leading specialist in the industry. They've completed over 700,000 tax deduction schedules for residential investment and commercial properties Australia-wide. BMT guarantee to find double your fee in the first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. Realty Talk and your host, Bushy Martin. Given the massive and across the board uplift in property values that occurred during the 18 months post pandemic, that saw the rising tide of prices lifting all properties to the tune of anywhere between 20 to 50% in this very short space of time, against the backdrop of long term average annual growth of just under 7% then many locations and property prices are likely to flatline and go sideways over the next five to 10 years, unless the location is one of the few that's going to experience new growth drivers resulting from the combination of new infrastructure, new industry and employment, and strong and growing income demographics. So how can you continue to build wealth in your property in this current climate? Well, you need to get creative and manufacture equity by adding value. And Joe Tucker, who's the Director and Head of Research at Property Principles Buyers Agency Group, as well as being the co-founder of the hugely popular Oz Property Investors Facebook Forum, joins us now to open your eyes and ears to the opportunity. So welcome back to Realty Talk, Joe. Thanks for having me again, Bushy. Wonderful to see you as always. Always, mate. Uh, love your company and uh, really enjoyed uh, having the opportunity to uh, press the flesh in Geelong not too long ago, which was a lot of fun. But, mate, uh, a really good topic for you to sort of dive into today, given the challenges that a lot of areas are going to experience in property moving forward. So to kick things off, uh, can you explain the fundamental principles of adding value to property? Yeah, well, it's one of these things when the market has expanded so rapidly over the past 24 months where people just think, well, I'll just buy any house and it'll be worth, you know, 500,000. It's now worth 600,000. That last 24 months is not what the next 24 months is going to look like. So we need to start getting a little bit more creative with the way that we purchase our properties. And a great way to do that is through adding value, which is kind of what we, we talk about a lot. Um, it just allows you to also accelerate your property journey quicker because you get that equity, uh, you get that equity uplift. Um, and, and the good thing is with property, it's one of the only assets that allows you to be an active investor and allows you to push that value. So you can buy a property for $500,000, spend $50,000 on a renovation, and then it's worth $600,000. That $50,000 of cash that you've just put in, that's 100% return on capital. Like no, nothing else gives you that return, but then you can then use that equity to then go again. Um, but I guess the core fundamental principles of adding value is find a problem 
and create a solution. But when you're starting out, maybe just don't find too big of a problem that you can you can't solve because that's where you can get a little bit too uh, too excited about it. But um, I always like to think about uh, frozen equity for people that are a little bit scared to maybe do a full renovation project, you can still freeze equity into the future, be it renovation, subdivision, developments, things like that. You don't actually need to be an expert renovator right now, but if you can buy a property that you can add a room to, add some value to, you can then, when you're comfortable, dethaw that equity. And when you need it, you can then, yeah, leverage that. So, um, that was long-winded, but I hope it answered your question. Yeah, well and truly, yeah, you covered the full breadth of the exercise there, mate, so beautifully done. Now, with, with every reward, there are risks attached. So what are some of the risks involved and, and how can they be mitigated with that? Mate? Well, the biggest risk that I see all the time is people overcapitalizing on the numbers and not building to the demographic, not renovating to the demographic of people that actually live in the area. Now, the the... A great way to do that is to do your area research, but the best way to do that area research is call up the property managers. They are the unsung heroes of property. I absolutely love property managers and they just they just don't get the respect that they deserve. They will tell you exactly what that area needs. Um, they will say, hey, actually, did you know you could open this wall up and get a free flowing kitchen, which would then help get this type of tenant? Um, so what people do though, is they overcapitalize. So they'll get a granite bench top and they'll spend $20,000 on this bench top, but it's not double bay in Sydney it's you know logan they should be spending you know ten thousand dollars on a kitchen renovation not twenty thousand dollars so i see a lot of challenges in that um uh, a couple of other challenges is not having the right team in place people think that these renovations these ugly ducklings as we call them type properties um you need to do everything but you don't i i am um, i help people do this right like it's 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 something that you can outsource to somebody else to be able to boost it so you don't need to be an absolute expert renovator you don't need to do that you can get the right team but the to diy and do it yourself speak to your rent uh your property managers and they'll give you some amazing insights on it yeah no really good advice there mate uh, so diving into renovation then what, what are mm. some of the great renov renovation techniques that can actually maximize returns in your view well, the biggest bang for your buck is everyone's favorite, um, painting. You know, paint gives you, it just adds so much value. It gives you that fresh feel of just walking in. Um, my other little favorite one is updating all the light switches and um, power points because you know how they get that yellow, yellow. faded tinge? You've yeah. got this fresh, brand new white wall, and all of a sudden that yellow tinge shines through. But you can get an electrician to fix them up in in no time and not spend very much. Um, the next biggest bang for your buck is adding a bedroom or adding a bathroom. Um, recently, we bought a three bedroom property that had two living areas, um, one massive living area. So when we added the fourth bedroom, uh, it didn't take up, it didn't really take away from the property. It actually added to it. What I do see sometimes is someone will create a fourth bedroom out of a living space when there's only one. Just don't get caught out in that because people still need a place to live. Um, but when you do that, when you do add value via an extra bathroom, an extra bedroom, you are going into the next tier on RP data. We are not, when we renovate to keep, we're not trying to entertain the the owner occupier market we're trying to highlight um and get the the uh the appraisal we need the valuer to see value in our property so as soon as we go from a 3-1 to a 4-2 automatically he has no choice but to put us in that category which is depending on the area hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollars more and that's instant equity that you've just created out of out of very minimal effort so i like those type of little tips and tricks yeah some great tips and tricks there Let, let's talk, talk about the sort of bigger uh entity and that's getting into the development subdivision area when thinking about those what's the best way for someone to go about getting their head around it joe well it's pretty big it, it, it can feel pretty big it can feel overwhelming but the best way is just to call the local council and become an expert in the three or four little pockets and hopefully they're within the same council so you can just understand what are the requirements what are the zoning so what zone am i in am i in general neighborhood am i in high diversity neighborhood um high residential what is that and what can fit on a block then understand what are the minimum lot sizes so the reason why we want to do subdivision is because if you buy a brand new house and land on a you know 300 square meter block 
you only have to wait for organic growth. So you're forced. If you buy a property that you can add value to, you can then do a renovation um, that then boom, gives you an extra $50,000 of equity. Great. But if you have subdivision potential or development potential down the line, you can then again, unfreeze that equity when you need it. Um, but again, you don't need to be the expert. There are, um, uh, buyer's agent slash development agents, right? Like what a buyer's agent is, development agents exist. They're called developers and they will handhold you through the entire process, but you don't need to be an absolute expert now. Just understand the flood zones, the bushfire zones, um, what an easement is, uh, if that's across the lot. And then you'll be able to see, great, this is a 600 meter square lot. I need the frontage of the house to be a minimum of 18 square meters in South Australia. I'll just talk to that as an example. Great, this property can be subdivided because there's no flood, there's no fire, and there's no easement. Great, that's all I need to know. And in 10 years time, I'll unlock that equity. And I don't need to know how to develop. I don't need to be the expert in subdivision, I'll just call my developer and they'll do it all for me. And you can be hands off as hands off as possible, or you can try and do it yourself, but you know, focus on what you're the best at, but think about that when you're next purchasing a property, is there subdivision potential? Is there value add? That's the kind of way I like to think about it. Yeah. I love it. And, and as you well say, it's not as if you have to do it now or do it straight away and do it yourself. You're mm -hmm. buying the future potential that you can then unfreeze and access the equity uh, either by selling or, or developing or whatnot. But it, and you're immediately starting to lock in additional value in there for equity in the property just by being smart about it from day one. Have it locked away in your head. Can I, can I do this? And then ask the question to a town planner. And it's amazing how many town planners there are in Australia that are just sitting on a desk ready to answer that question for you because they live and breathe this stuff. And they just want to know, yes, you can actually. You can put a, a house here and one on the back. Oh, perfect. I now have an extra opportunity. I love it. Absolutely love it, mate. Well, uh, as always, Joe, uh, thanks for the very timely insights and you've yet again reinforced the need to be creative and proactive when it comes to building wealth through property rather than just sitting back and hoping that the market's going to do all the work because as you, both, you and I both know, where there's a will, there's always a way in property. So I'm going to encourage everyone who's listening uh, and interested in adding value by manufacturing equity in their properties to reach out to you at propertyprinciples.com.au and to join your rapidly growing cast of thousands in your highly engaged Oz Property Investors Facebook community. So thanks again for your generous time on the show again today, Joe. Thank you very much, Bushy. Love to chat to you guys. Have a good one. Successful property investment is a game of finance. Do you have the right team and the right game plan? Realty Talk is brought to you by Know How Property. More than mortgage brokers, Bushy Martin and his team of investment architects set you up with a sustainable strategy structured to lower your costs, tax, risk and stress while increasing your capacity for growth. Know How has helped over 1,900 homeowners and investors secure more than $800 million in property wealth. So get set to live more, work less, and live your legacy. Want to know how to invest in your freedom? Visit knowhowproperty.com.au. This is Realty Talk, powered by realty.com.au. As many property purchasers are currently facing challenges in adding to their portfolios due to lending restrictions and borrowing capacity constraints, we thought it opportune to revisit the different types of ownership vehicles that you have at your disposal to secure property and the pros and cons of these in terms of capacity, cost, protection, and risk. And before we get into it, I need to state the bleeding obvious that everything we're going to share today is general in nature and is in no way intended as financial advice. So please ensure that you consult independent and investment savvy accountants and allied finance professionals to ascertain what's best for your specific situation and risk profile before deciding on the best ownership structure and strategy for you. I'm joined by fellow finance broker, John Mancimelli from full service financial services company, Hunterwood Solutions. So to, to kick things off, uh, can you sort of give us a rundown on the six main asset holding entities that investors can choose when buying a property? Yeah, great question. And it's important that listeners are aware of this because it can have an effect, as you know, Bushy, on your tax and, uh, and finance and lending. So the first one obviously is just your personal name. That's that's easy. Uh, 
Moving on, we could look at joint tenants where you have your 50-50 ownership. Uh, then you could have, moving on to your third one, you have tenants in common where you could skew the ownership to uh, a person who pays lease tax, for example. We could touch on that later. Yep. Uh, some of the fourth, some of the others are the fourth one is a special purpose vehicle that uh, seems to be uh, running around the internet at the moment, and everyone's contacting me regarding SPVs and what the hell is that? Yep. Um, we could look at buying a property in a company. I don't really see that, but it does happen. Um, and then the last one, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Bushy. I think a self managed super fund would be classified as a different form of asset holding entity. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a very different ownership structure with that different tax treatments and uh, and a whole bunch of other things. So, yeah, spot on, mate. Uh, that's a really good summary. Uh, uh, what I'd love to get your thoughts around from a finance perspective, uh, what are the implications for each of these entities in, in that sense? I love what you're doing with this segment, Wushi, because as you know, it really does have an, uh, an effect on your borrowing capacity, let alone your tax and things like that. So we'll just keep it to the finance side of things. So uh, we know that there are lenders that are going to that are going to look at asset holding entities in different ways and allocate the liabilities in different ways as well. So if you have joint tenants, which is 50-50, then you know that the liabilities are pretty much going to still be 100%. But there will be some lenders who have common debt reducer policies that if the other party can prove that they can carry their liability, then there will be some um, forgiveness, if you like, on your partner's um, property uh, and finance, sorry. Yeah. With the other ones like tenants in common, this can really help you skew the revenue into your name. So if you put 90% in your name and 10% in your partner's name, you could really skew the revenue from your rental property that can really help you down the track with your second or third or fourth acquisition. Yeah, and, and it significantly improves the cash flow affordability when you do that because you're you're keeping more of the, the couple's hard-earned money in their pockets rather than going to the tax office. So uh, yep. that, that's a good thing to consider. What, what about the others, mate? Yeah, so moving into, say, um, I don't know if you want to touch on SPVs. You, you might... Yeah, let, let's dive into those in a bit more detail later on, because as, as you've well said, there's a, a lot of uh, talk in the industry about those at the moment, and a lot of accountants out there pushing them as as exercises. But uh, perhaps just touch on the, the key bits, and then we'll drill down on that a little bit later on. Okay. Um, um, Self-managed super funds, well, no, trusts. People can buy discretionary or unit trusts. Um, uh, hybrid trusts is the third one, which is not as common nowadays. So we know that using those vehicles will limit the, the number of lenders. The example of uh, some lenders won't even touch trust and other lenders will. Yeah. So you, you, you'll, you'll still have plenty of choice. It's just that it, it'll be a dozen lenders rather than normal 30 lenders. Yeah. And again, the type of trust that you set up will have an impact. So a, a hybrid trust is a bit of a no-no, as you know, Bushy. Yeah. Um, most people will do a discretionary trust, otherwise colloquially known as a family trust. Um, and there's also a unit trust. And there's, there's, a, there's an opportunity for you to negatively gear in a unit trust. There is a way to do it, and I actually personally do that. Uh, there's this belief to say that trust, you can't carry losses forward. You can, but it's with a unit trust and not a discretionary trust. And um for those of you who are listening and want to know more, feel free to reach out to me. But there is a way to do it. Uh, we can't do it through the the, the this vehicle of a radio or or YouTube. But yeah, that's a, that's another massive way of looking at asset holding entities. Um, self managed self managed super funds, Bushy. Should we? Touch on yeah, that. yeah, absolutely. Let's touch, touch on those, mate, because, uh, again, there's been increased talk around it. Given that people are struggling through the normal channels, uh, there's a lot of people out there pushing self-managed super. So I'd, I'd love for you to uh, dig into that if you can, please, John. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting right now, the amount of people, as we go to, to recording in July 2023, the amount of people that have gone on a max let's into a self-managed super so in a nutshell uh it's a it's a an entity that allows you to grab the super uh create a pool of money and you as a director of that super fund can invest it however you want and the banks will lend you up to 80 percent of the value of the property for residential 
Uh, Bushy, what is it for commercial nowadays? Would it be up it's, to 70? Yeah, 60 to 70%, depending on the lender, of course, but it's it's around that sort of figure. So lower LVR, you need a, a bigger deposit uh, with those than the, the resi space. But uh, certainly, some uh, increasingly, as you would have seen, there's lenders sort of moving back into that space after getting cold yeah. feet uh, a few years ago. Uh, given the interest that's now there and the number of people who are putting up their hand for it, uh, it's it's actually the lending criteria around that are getting a, a little bit easier in the context. Thank God. Of, uh, yeah, thank yes, goodness. At last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in the resi space, the maximum LVR is 80%. The onus is on you to provide a 20% deposit plus costs. And then finally, some lenders will have what's called a liquidity test, which is roughly 5% of the purchase price. So if you bought a house for hundred grand, the bank wants to see $5,000 sitting in either stocks or, or liquid cash, just in case you can't make repayments, okay? Yeah. Um, it's a little bit complicated because we know that you can't buy a property in the name of your self-managed super fund. We know that you have to buy it in a bear trust not in the name of your self-managed super fund. So please, 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 as you know, Bushy, don't buy it in the name of your self-managed super fund. At the time of your purchase, you go off to your accountant and create a bear trust. Yeah. And the bear trust, because of legislation, can hold the property until such time that the self-managed super fund does not have any more debt in it. Yes. Okay? Yeah. So a um, fantastic way to diversify your super, fantastic way to to do um, greater cash on cash returns or and increase your ROI. Uh, I, I, you know, please speak to your financial planner and accountant, obviously. But um, yeah, I'd really encourage you to have a look at it for the obvious benefits, such as no capital gains tax in retirement. Spot on, and, and only fifteen percent uh, tax on the way in and the way through. So you, you know, for most yeah. people, that's a considerable deduction. Uh, in that context. And for properties that you're looking to hold as legacy properties that uh, you want to hold post-retirement or to hand on to family, there's some, there's some real benefits in considering that. So, But like everything, uh, there is considerable cost to set it up. There's considerable administration cost in a self-managed super fund because the legis legislative requirements around that and the compliance are very specific. So make sure you've got a really good accountant on board who understands how that all works and then is going to look after you, not only in the setup and the establishing the bear trust, as you've well said, but then the ongoing administration of that. So you, you need to have enough time, you need to have the right team, because if you uh, start uh, missing dotting the I's and crossing the T's in self-managed super, you can get yourself into some hot water with some pretty big penalties. So yeah. uh, and I do, I have helped you understand your responsibilities. I've written an e-book called An Insider Secrets to Buy a Property in a Self-Managed Super Fund. So you're welcome to contact Bushy and or myself and uh, you, I'm happy to provide it to the listeners. Yeah, brilliant offer. Yeah, it, and a, a great resource for people to really get their head around that. Now, I, I want to sort of dive into uh, SPVs if we can or special purpose vehicles uh, as it's better known and uh, better term, John, because uh, you know there, there is a lot of talk around it. So, can you sort of to, to sort of break it down into simple language? Uh, can you uh, explain what is an SPV? How's it set up, and how does it differ from a the normal property loan perspective? Great. All right. So, special purpose vehicles. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you read in the media about you know the bus driver who has thirty properties and you're wondering to yourself, how the hell did they get the borrowing to make that happen? And, and and so occasionally you'll see an article in the Daily Telegraph or whatever, and the person will talk about their SPV, special purpose vehicle. And so what it what they try what it tries to do is mitigate your personal borrowing limitations. And and how it works is it's essentially a trust where if you purchased a property and it's a a property that pays for all the expenses, your mortgage, your council rates, your property management fees. The way some lenders will look at it is that it's an ecosystem that is self-fulfilling, that doesn't leak any money in the sense of you're not having to put any money into the SPV to fund the property. So if you have an ecosystem if you if for want of a better word, that pays for itself, then there are some lenders that will sort of discount the 
liability associated with that because, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bushy, the legislation is not the same because it's not a personal um, legislation that falls under what's called NCCP requirements. And it's more of a it's more of a business requirement. Is that it's is yeah, that what it, you, it, it falls into corporate law, not not the, the, the residential requirements. So there's there's very different uh, stipulations and, and requirements around that sector compared to the, the personal lending situation. And, and therefore, to, providing that special purpose vehicle is standalone and it's it's positively geared at, at all times, then uh, there's no obligation on the borrower to actually declare that uh, if they're, they're looking to, to borrow through the normal residential channels. Yeah, so through that normal residential channel that you mentioned, Bushy, the banker ha is required under legislation to ensure that they don't take a loan that's unsuitable for them. And so there's these un other sets of legislation that business and corporate stuff that you mentioned that the bank can go, right, we're now talking about a business environment. This whole um, loan that's not unsuitable and legislation type stuff doesn't really apply. So it's becoming quite topical to set up SPVs so that you can continue to build a property portfolio. So that's the main advantage where it, it, it can, under the right circumstances with the right lenders and the right bankers, set you up for very strong borrowing. However, there are some drawbacks. Yeah, look, yeah, and a lot of people drive into those. Yeah, yeah. let's what walk through think? those. I've that's got right. a number of them. Yeah, yeah no, 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 far away, John, because I think it's important that people understand not only the rewards of building the portfolio, but the risk that they might be putting themselves in. Uh, so I'd, I'd love for you to shed, shed some light on that, John. Okay, so the first one, I suppose, is that there's no guarantee that a lender will will look at your SPV and say, yep, yeah, we'll uh, disregard the liability in that first property you bought in a trust, okay? Yeah. Uh, they, they may do it now, but that doesn't mean that they will do it tomorrow. Yeah. So you run the risk of setting up these structures in the hope that down the track, some other lender or the same lender will move forward with you. All right. So that's the one overarching thing. You've got to go into this. Maybe just saying to yourself, I have to understand that I may not get future borrowings using this sort of setup. The second part is the cost. So every time you buy a positively geared property and put it into an SPV, your accountant is going to set up a trust every single time. And so there's a setup cost, and then every year there is the tax costs. So if you can imagine, if, if once you get to you know quite a few properties, five, ten properties, then you're paying a return every year for those. Yeah. So just keep that in mind in terms of upfront costs and ongoing costs. So um, they're the two main ones, Bushy. If you for the yeah, a couple of others yeah there's a couple that I might uh, mention and that is that uh, to to produce a a property in a vehicle that is positive cash flow uh, particularly with rates where they're at and and potentially where they're going to be for a period of time it generally means that you're going to have to put significantly more cash into the deal so uh, it's really only going to suit uh, investors who have considerable equity that they can put towards the the exercise because uh, you don't need to borrow too much for suddenly tip it into uh, negative uh, territory and then it w does start having the impact on individuals uh, financial capability so make sure you cover that off and if you do go down this road you need to ensure that whichever lender you're uh, looking to uh, get behind the exercise doesn't impose any personal guarantees so uh, because as soon as there's a personal guarantee hidden in the paperwork, then potentially that uh, will disrupt the ability to, to uh, continue to add properties because that then uh, may fall into the equation of uh, creating the need to declare that if it's going to have an impact on your financial position. So uh, so there's some good ones. But, but again, it's like everything. Uh, you need to uh, do some homework and assess uh, the viability and the appropriateness of that for your particular situation. Uh, I encourage uh, those that, that are looking at increasing their capacity and, and needing to add uh, properties to their portfolio to reach out to John and myself to talk about that further. And uh, John, uh, as always, I, I really want to thank you for these great insights around this, this whole ownership exercise because it's going to have a massive impact 
not only on your capacity, but also your cash flow affordability. So, you know, you need to choose the right vehicle and talk to a number of people. Accountants traditionally uh, have the uh, right to advise around ownership structures, but uh, equally, a lot of the time I find a, a, quite a few accountants don't look at the actual cash flow impacts of those entities. So uh, you probably would have seen this yourself too, John, where there's a, a, in the last couple of years, there's been a big focus on investors buying in properties in trusts, in various form of trusts. But because all the tax uh, benefits and incentives are quarantined within that trust vehicle, quite often the, the weekly holding cost of uh, hanging onto a property jumps up quite significantly. So that, that needs to be taken into account when you're choosing whether you're buying as, as joint tenants, as tenants in common in a trust through a self-managed super fund or the special purpose vehicles that we've spoken about. Pick the right one to suit your circumstance today and then re-look at that. Every time you're adding a property, make sure you're getting the right vehicle at the right time to suit your ongoing strategy. So look, um, John, I just want to thank you again. Uh, it's very clear, I think, that if you want to optimise your opportunities in property, you do need to think outside the square and explore all of the options by surrounding yourself with independent and proven professionals, particularly in the areas of accounting and finance. But I also want to finish with a word of caution. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. You need to balance the potential rewards by fully considering all of the risks. Because when things get tough or tight in the future, the broker or the bank giving you the loan to buy the extra money for that property that you're securing through the normal channels isn't going to be around to help you make your repayments. They're not the ones taking the risk, you are. And remember that building wealth is a marathon, not a sprint. It's about endurance and hanging in there for 15 years plus and surviving the ongoing cash flow affordability of that period so that you can last long enough to actually reap rewards. Don't shipwreck yourself by going too hard and too far too early. Unfortunately, as you and I know, John, the road to financial freedom is littered with the roadkill of impatient get-rich-quickers. So be conservative, considerate of how you're going to afford the repayments long-term and during periods when things get tough. And this doesn't mean being ultra-conservative because stretching safely is actually a good thing to consider, but don't be blind to the fact that you have to make the repayments regardless of what's happening with interest rates and make sure that you factor in long-term that at some stage, it's likely that your interest only repayments, if you're doing that for your investment portfolio, will have to switch to principal and interest. And you need to be able to afford uh, these extra repayments that could jump anywhere more than 35% at that point in time. Now, just to reinforce, I'm talking about being sensitive and safe when it comes to how much you're borrowing and build in considerable rainy day savings or equity contingency reserves. So all, I'm, all we're really saying is that you need to plan for the worst and then expect the best. Because if you overextend, you risk not being able to hold a good quality property for the long period of time required. And if this occurs, the chances are you're not going to end up making any money. So before you do anything, turn to reputable and proven independent finance professionals who are investment savvy, like the teams at Hunterwood Solutions and Know How Property Finance. And John, I really wanna thank you for taking the time to share your words of wisdom on this very important topic. Oh, very humbled, Bushy. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Property depreciation is the natural wear and tear of a building and its assets. Property investors can claim depreciation as a tax deduction each financial year. Depreciation is a non-cash deduction. This means you don't need to spend any money in order to claim it. On average, BMT tax depreciation find residential investors almost $9,000 in first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. Subscribe now to Realty Talk. It's out every week. And that brings us to the end of this week's show. A big thanks to both Joe and John, as well as Bushy, for a great show. Make sure you don't miss a single episode of Realty Talk or Bushy's Get Invested podcast delivered to you each and every week. And you can do that by subscribing to The Property Hub now on your favourite podcast player or wherever you're listening to or watching this show. Thanks to our supporters and content partners, realty.com.au, BMT Tax Depreciation, Know How Property Finance, Get Rare Property and Apiro Marketing. I'm Kevin Turner and on behalf of Bushy and The Property Hub team, we look forward to seeing you again next week.